The journey begins in the city of Glasgow. 100 miles ahead is the port of Oban. 122 miles down the line, the old garrison town of Fort William. And a further 40 miles ahead, the town of Malik. On the way are landscapes that still resonate with the victories and tragedies of our country's past. In fact, the signs of Scotland's history are all around. Just outside the city of Glasgow on the Clyde coast is Cardross, where one of Scotland's most famous and remarkable kings, Robert the Bruce, spent the final years of his life. Bruce wasn't a Scot, but the son of an Anglo-Norman family who were loyal to the English king. But by 1306, Bruce had changed allegiance, overwhelmed all rivals for the Scottish throne, and crowned himself King of Scotland. Throughout the Scottish Wars of Independence, he rallied and united the Scots as no king before him, and gallantly led them to victory over Edward II's English armies at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. Edward was determined to rid himself of this troublesome Scottish king. But his attempts to have Bruce excommunicated from the church outraged Scotland's nobles, clergymen and commons alike. They turned their outrage into action in 1320 by drafting one of Scotland's most momentous documents, the Declaration of Our Broth, proclaiming their devotion to Robert Bruce, to freedom and to Scotland's right for independence. We fight not for glory, nor riches, nor honour, but only for that liberty which no true man relinquishes but with his life. By the providence of God, by the right of succession, by those laws and customs which we are resolved to defend even with our lives, and by our own just consent, he is our king. For so long as an hundred remain alive, we are minded never a whit to bow beneath the yoke of English dominion. By 1328, Bruce had successfully achieved peace and independence for Scotland from England. But he died only a year later, never knowing that his hard-fought peace was not to last. This is only the beginning of a journey scattered with names and places that have changed Scottish history. A few miles further on at Helensborough is the Highland Fault Line, the official start of the Scottish Highlands. From here, the line passes the entrance to the Gearloch, and in the distance, the town of Greenock, the birthplace of James Watt, inventor of the steam engine. In the 1890s, paddle steamers took thousands of West Coast holidaymakers from the mainland to the Clyde's popular seaside resorts. Generations of visitors left the industrial city of Glasgow behind and set off from here and from the heart of Glasgow itself for the fresh air and clear waters of Arran, Rothsey and Danoon, and they still do. Ironically, during the period of the Highland Clearances, this area was the last site that many Scots would ever have of their home country as they boarded ships bound for the Americas. With the Highland way of life changing and the clan system crumbling, the role of the Highland chiefs was whittled away. Many who had once been the protectors of their clansmen were reduced to being landowners whose main concern was to make their large estates more economical. They discovered that the easiest way to do so was to farm sheep. And so it was that during this tragic period, hundreds of families were evicted from the highlands and forced to pack their meagre belongings aboard ships bound for the new world. This stretch of line is never far from the sea lochs, islets and inland lochs carved over millions of years by the elements and the powerful Atlantic Ocean. But beyond the Gearloch and the Firth of Clyde lies what is perhaps the most famous of all Scotland's lochs, Loch Lomond. Six miles wide at its broadest point and 23 miles long, Loch Lomond is the largest area of fresh water in Britain. Its outstanding beauty and romance have inspired generations of poets and writers. Of their works, perhaps the most famous of all is the ballad Loch Lomond.
This song tells the story of a young Jacobite soldier captured by the English and condemned to death far from his home. He writes a farewell letter to his sweetheart, reminding her of happier times and of the legend that if a Highlander dies outside Scotland, his spirit will return to the shores of Loch Lomond, but by the low road. Tack the high road, and I'll tack the low road, and I'll be in Scotland afore ye. But me and my true love will never meet again on the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. Loch Lomond is studded with small islands and surrounded by villages. The area stretching from Inversnaid east to Balchidder is associated with the outlawed MacGregors of Clan Gregor. Sir Walter Scott, the author of the Waverley novels, stayed here in 1817 while he was researching the book which takes its name from the most famous of all the MacGregors, Rob Roy, whom Scott immortalised as a romantic folk hero. Like Robin Hood of England, he was a kind and gentle robber, and while he took from the rich, was liberal in relieving the poor. All whom I have conversed with, and I have in my youth seen some who knew Rob Roy personally, gave him the character of a benevolent and humane man in his way. Rob Roy was a cattle trader, but not always the most successful. Although his partner, the Duke of Montrose, lent him money, MacGregor lost this too and believing that he had been swindled, the Duke of Montreux saw to it that MacGregor's home and possessions were seized and effectively had MacGregor outlawed. Before long, MacGregor was obliged to change profession from cattle trader to cattle thief. Rob Roy MacGregor being lately entrusted by several noblemen and gentlemen with considerable sums of money for buying cows for them, has treacherously gone off with the money to the value of one thousand pounds sterling. All magistrates and officers of His Majesty's forces are entreated to seize upon the said Rob Roy and the money which he carries with him until the person concerned Though hunted and with a price on his head, Rob Roy was never daunted. In fact, to amuse his friends, he wrote a mischievous letter to the Duke of Montrose, challenging him to meet him and settle their differences man to man. In charity to your grace's courage and conduct, please know the only way to retrieve both is in appointing your place and choice of arms. This saves your grace and the troops any further trouble of searching. That is, if your ambition of glory press you to embrace this unequal venture offered of Rob's head. But if your grace's cowardice forbids hazarding this gentlemanly expedient, then let your design of peace restore what you have robbed from me. Despite his brushes with the law, Rob Roy lived to a ripe old age and died peacefully at his home in the parish of Balhuida, where he is buried. Travelling high above Loch Lomond, the line journeys through Glen Falloch. One suggested translation from this Gaelic name is Hidden Valley, possibly because the Glen was once covered by the Great Caledonian Forest. This is another area where water abounds. Not lochs this time, but roaring waterfalls. The largest of these is the Falloch Falls. Just ahead, the seven spans of the Falloch Viaduct then carry the line over the Blackwater Gorge. From there, the line continues on towards Crean Larach, where it divides. West to Oban, which was the former Calendar and Oban Railway, completed in 1880, and north to Fort William, on what was the North British Railway, opened in 1894. Though they now both form part of the West Highland Line, each route still retains its own unique character. With stations to Oban painted the Cali blue and white, and with the North British green on all stations to Fort William. Travelling northwest to Oban through Strathfillan, the line then turns west beyond Tyne Drum to cross the east-west watershed of Scotland, 
at 900 feet, the highest point on the Glasgow Urban Line, before descending Glen Lochy through some of the most picturesque scenery on the line. Peaceful now, there is ample evidence here of more turbulent times. Down below on Loch Awe sits Kilcharn Castle, built in 1450. This was the seat of the Glen Orchie Campbells, a clan which has earned its place in Scottish history for its involvement in one of the most tragic and infamous of events, the Massacre of Glencoe. It is 1689, and King James VII and II has been overthrown by his Dutch son-in-law, William of Orange. But while even one Highlander remains loyal to James, William fears uprisings. And so, to ensure their loyalty, he orders them to swear an oath of allegiance. The Highland chiefs reluctantly agree, but it is winter time, and the spiteful weather and a catalogue of misunderstandings delay the last clan chief McKeon, who was also known as MacDonald of Glencoe, in his journey to take the oath. When he arrives five days late, King William and his Secretary of State decide to seize their chance. A letter from the Master of Stair to the Campbell Earl of Bredalban maps out their intentions. I think the Clan Donnell must be rooted out before they can get the help they depend upon. The winter time is the only season in which we are sure the Highlanders cannot escape and carry their wives, bairns and cattle to the hills. This is the proper time to maul them in the long, dark nights. Word was given for a company of the Earl of Argyle's Campbell troops, led by Captain Robert Campbell of Glenlyon, to be billeted with the MacDonalds. When they arrived, the Campbells were made welcome and spent a pleasant time with the clan, eating and sleeping, drinking and playing cards with their hosts, the MacDonalds. Until two weeks later, Captain Campbell received his orders. You are hereby ordered to fall upon the MacDonalds of Glencoe and to put all to the sword under 70. You are to have special care that the old fox and his sons do on no account escape your hands. Dozens of men, women and children were slaughtered in their homes. Their chief, McKeon, and his lady murdered. Others were driven out into the snow and forced to flee the glen forever, or were left to perish along with their cattle. At the time, news of the massacre horrified people throughout the highlands and beyond. Its memory still haunts the area today, and gave rise to this lament. They came in the blizzard, we offered them heat, a roof for their heads, dry shoes for their feet. We wind them and dined them, they ate all our meat, and they slept. In the house of MacDonald Oh, cruel is the snow That sweeps Glencoe And covers the grave of Donald And cruel was the Some died in their beds at the hands of the foe. Some fled in the night, were lost in the snow. Some lived to accuse him, was struck the first blow, but gone. Was the house O MacDonald?
Travelling west towards Oban, beyond Loch Ore, the scenery becomes particularly dramatic and proved a real test for the men who built the line. Running along the foot of the mountain of Ben Cruachan, the line cuts through the great glacial fault of the Pass of Brander, where it's said that the waters of Loch Ore are as deep as the sides of the pass are high. Beyond Tenault is Loch Etiv, where legend has it, Deirdre of the Sorrows and her lover once sought refuge. Celtic mythology tells us that Deirdre, the most beautiful woman in all Gaeldom, fled her native Ireland and the unwanted attentions of the Irish king with her lover. It is said that they lived in Glenetive in safety until the king of Ireland sent for them, promising that they were forgiven. The lovers returned, only to be put to death, but their love lives on in ancient legend. 2 thirds of the way through the journey to Oban, the West Highland Line runs through rock cuttings past wooded hillsides and on towards the steel cantilever bridge over the Falls of Laura at Connell Ferry, and on again to Loch Linney, the entrance to the Great Glen which stretches right across Scotland to the Moray Firth, and on again to the Port of Oban. Translated from the Gaelic, the name Oban means Little Bay. The journey to Oban along this, the oldest railway in the West Highlands, offers a truly breathtaking experience. The town's sheltered harbour has attracted settlers here for some 8,000 years. Today, Oban attracts many thousands of visitors, and it is still the major port to the inner and outer Hebrides. Ships await to take passengers and supplies to the Isles of Mull, Col, Tyree, Barra, Uist, Iona and many others islands and scenery that inspired Mendelssohn's Hebridean Overture. Branching north from Crean Larach, the West Highland Line stretches up to Fort William, making its way through beautiful and daunting terrain. Among the most breathtaking views is the Great Horseshoe Curve, a majestic sweep formed by twin viaducts crossing Ben Oder and Ben Doran and turning east into the rugged moorland of Rannoch Moor, the traditional haunt of broken men and outlaws. Land here was so waterlogged that the line's Victorian engineers were forced to float the railway tracks on a bed of ashes, branches and trees. Conditions were not much better for the railway workers who staffed these isolated outposts. The winter of 1894-95 was a particularly cruel one. The signalman at Karar Summit, the Fort William line's highest point at 1300 feet, wrote to his superiors, it is impossible to keep instruments in working order, as there is no ports, rain pours in at the doors. I am standing in three inches of water. Part of the roof blown off today. The agent at Rannach has completely lost heart. The porter and signalman at Rannach, the signalman and his wife and daughter at Spean Bridge, and the signalman at Tullach are still living in waiting rooms and the signalman at Crean Larich in a wooden hut. The constant stream of telegraph messages would seem to confirm conditions were just as bleak further down the line. The bad weather sometimes seemed unrelenting. Snowplow from Fort William this morning stuck in heavy wreath of snow about 14 feet deep. Have wired cow layers for another snowplow. The snowplow which departed Fort William at 7.30 a.m. is covered with snow and fire out. Men had to retreat from icy cold. There is no end to this weather, but we must keep the line open. So many people depend on us. Managed to get line clear as far as 82 and a half mile post where engine with plow is embedded. Cutting near Rannoch, completely choked up. Men working at Tullach and a snowplow from Glasgow working from other end. 
But if the winters were harsh, the landscape and changing seasons brought a grandeur and beauty to the area around Fort William which captivated and enchanted Queen Victoria and her husband Prince Albert on their visits here, as she wrote in her journals. And now came the finest scene of all, Ben Nevis and its surrounding high hills, and the others in the direction of Loch Lagan, all pink and glowing in that lovely afterglow which you see in the Alps. It was glorious. It grew fainter and fainter till the hills became blue and then grey. And at last it became almost dark before we reached Banavi, and we only got home at a quarter past eight. As we drove out, I sketched Ben Nevis from the carriage. On her visits here, Queen Victoria visited another famous landmark, a staggering feat of engineering, completed over 70 years before the West Highland Line, the Caledonian Canal. Engineered by Thomas Telford, the famous canal runs for 60 miles, with a series of locks known as Neptune Staircase, connecting a chain of inland lochs from Loch Linney to the Moray Firth. During this period, the novels of Scott and the visits of Queen Victoria helped popularize the Highlands as never before, and the West Highland Line provided all the landscapes, colorful characters, and historic sites its eager visitors could desire, such as the Glenfinnan Viaduct. At 100 feet high, this was Britain's first concrete viaduct, and as well as being an impressive feat of Victorian engineering, it has stunning views over Loch Shiel and, in the distance, the Glenfinnan Monument. This stands in silent testament to the bravery of the Highlanders who gave their lives for the Jacobite cause of Prince Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie. It was here, in August 1745, that Bonnie Prince Charlie first raised his standard and gathered the clans to the Jacobite cause. He stood on the shore, eagerly awaiting the clans and optimistic of his success in returning the Stuarts to the throne. He expected a massive gathering of the clans, but was sorely disappointed to find only 200 or so men. Lochiel, whom the prince had counted as a firm supporter, seemed particularly reluctant. With the few friends that I have, I will erect the royal standard and proclaim to the people of Britain that Charles Stuart has come over to claim the crown of his ancestors, to win it or perish in the attempt. Lochiel may stay at home and learn from the newspapers the fate of his prince. But the prince was a charismatic and persuasive character. Lochiel was won over and did not disappoint his prince. Marching over the hill, their piper at their head, came Lochiel and 700 loyal clansmen. I'll share the fate of my prince. And so shall every man, over whom nature or fortune hath given me any power. They could not have foretold in those first euphoric weeks that their cause would end with the disastrous and bloody defeat at Culloden Moor which would force their prince into hiding. Nor the tragic irony of this setting where in just 14 months time Bonnie Prince Charlie would board a French frigate from the same sea loch where he had landed, destined for a life of exile from his beloved Highlanders. Many's the land fought on that day Well the claymore could wield When the night came silently lay Dead on Culloden's field Speed, bonny boat Like a bird on the wing Onward the sailors cry Carry the lad That's born to be king Over the sea to sky. By April 1901, seven years after the West Highland Line had reached Fort William, the 40-mile stretch of the Malig extension was completed, promising the growing number of tourists all manner of scenic wonders.
The new extension of the West Highland Railway from Fort William to Malig opens up a hitherto almost inaccessible, historically interesting and surpassingly rugged and romantic country unrivaled for grandeur. The scenery is of striking beauty and is very varied in its character, the chief individual features being picturesque lochs and bays, enchanting hills, historic glens, imposing peaks, magnificent sunset effects. Winding through steep rock cuttings, beyond Loch Elt and on to Arasig, the Malig extension has magnificent views out across the ocean to the distant islands of Egg and Rum. It sweeps on towards the white sandy beaches of Loch Mora and drops down again for the final descent into Malig, where many travellers then take a ferry bound for the beautiful Isle of Skye. Nestled on Scotland's Atlantic coast, Malig is the last halt on the breathtaking West Highland Line. 164 miles and a whole world away from its starting point in the city of Glasgow. Our journey has taken us through rugged and romantic countryside, across spectacularly engineered bridges and viaducts, and past the homes and resting places of some of Scotland's most famous sons and daughters. Crossing dramatic landscapes where remarkable events in Scotland's history were once played out, the West Highland Line is, indeed, one of the world's great railway journeys and an unforgettable experience. If you would like more information on the West Highland Line or on the scenic Kyle Line, please contact ScotRail's Marketing Manager at Caledonian Chambers, 87 Union Street, Glasgow.